This may sound kind of strange to you, but I was almost into adulthood before I realized I was an American. I'd never really thought about it. My family was born in America and we'd lived here all of our lives, but somehow it never occurred to any of us that just being a citizen of the United States meant we were Americans. To us, Americans were people who spoke or understood only one language and ate peanut butter and jelly on mushy white bread that came out of plastic packages. We were different. We were Italian. For me, as I'm sure for most second-generation Italian-American children who grew up in the 40s and 50s, there was a definite distinction drawn between them and us. Everyone else, Irish, Jewish, Polish, African-American, German, they were metagons, as my grandparents used to say. Those metagons. There was no animosity involved in that distinction, no prejudice, no hard feelings, just a friendly and a proud observation, because we were sure ours was a better way. For example, Americans had to go to stores to get what they needed. We had a bread man, a coal man, a junk man, an olive oil man, an ice man, and a fruit and vegetable man who came to us. They were the peddlers who plied the Italian neighborhoods every week. We didn't even have to watch for them to know they were there. We just waited for their call, their yell, their individual distinctive sound. In fact, we even had a man that sold clothing and dry goods door to door. All the ladies on the block would gather to see what was in that large bundle he carried on his back. And there were no set prices, just good, hard bargaining, even from the most timid of our neighbors. To this day, I can still hear the peddler's sad and sometimes frustrated lament. Take it! I'm a loser money, but I'm tired of carrying it around. But they always returned, and the game was played out again and again and again. We came to know them all, and they knew us. Metagons had to deal with strangers. What a shame. Truly, I felt sorry for them. And without home delivery, they never knew the pleasure of waking up in the morning to find a hot, crisp loaf of Italian bread waiting behind the screen door. And instead of being able to climb on back of a peddler's truck a couple of times a week just to hitch a ride somewhere, most of my Metagon friends had to be satisfied with walking or taking the bus to the supermarket. We got to ride because we were Italian and lived in the neighborhood. There was something else that amazed me about them. On holidays, my American friends or classmates ate turkey, stuffing, mashed potatoes, and cranberry sauce. But that was it. We ate those things too. But it was only after we had finished the antipasto, the soup, the spaghetti, and meatballs, and salad, and whatever else Mama thought might be appropriate for the holiday. And the turkey or chicken was usually accompanied by baked ham or roast veal, just in case somebody walked in who didn't like turkey or chicken. And all of that was followed by an assortment of fruits, nuts, pastries, cakes, and of course those homemade cookies we called pizzelles. No holiday was complete without some baking. None of that store-bought stuff for us. That was the way we learned early in our lives how to make a seven-course meal last from noon until 4 p.m., how to handle hot chestnuts without burning yourself, and how good it tasted to put tangerine wedges in red wine. I truly believe Italians have a lifelong romance with food. And speaking of food, Sunday was truly the big day of the week. That was the day you'd wake up to the smell of garlic and onions frying in olive oil. As you laid in bed, you could hear the hiss of tomatoes being dropped into a hot pan and you knew what was happening. The feast was being prepared. But good as it smelled, it was frustrating too. Sunday would not be Sunday without going to Mass, and of course you couldn't eat before Mass because you had to fast before receiving Communion. My grandmother used to say with a twinkle in her eye that suffering from the hunger was part of our penance. But the good part was that we knew when we got home from church we'd walk into the house and smell hot meatballs frying in the kitchen and race for the table. Nothing, absolutely nothing, tasted better than those meatballs and chunks of crunchy Italian bread dipped into a pot of that sauce. Even though it has been years, I can still taste it. Another big difference between them and us was that we had gardens. Not just flower gardens, but huge vegetable gardens, as my grandparents used to say, where we grew tomatoes, tomatoes, and more tomatoes. 
We sliced and ate them raw, cooked them and canned them. We called it jarred. Of course, we also grew peppers, basil, lettuce, zucchini. Some people even had a fig tree. A few of us raised chickens so we could have fresh eggs every day. And of course, everyone had a grapevine or two, and in the fall made homemade wine, lots of it. Of course, all of those things thrived year after year because, because we had something else it seemed our American friends didn't have. We had grandparents. Now, it wasn't that they didn't have grandparents. It was, it was just that theirs didn't live in the same house or on the same block. They had to go somewhere and visit their grandparents. We lived and ate with ours. And God forbid we didn't see them every single day. I can still hear both my grandfathers telling me in their unique version of Italian English, which I soon learned to understand quite well, how they came to America as young men on the boat. They told us the long hours and days they had to work in the factories and mines when they got here, and the hardships they endured in the olden days. They also told us how their families lived in rented tenements and took in boarders sometimes in order to make ends meet. They decided early on they didn't want their children and grandchildren to grow up in that kind of an environment, so when they had saved enough money, and I could never figure out quite how, they spent everything they had and bought a house. They were so proud to own their own homes, and those houses served as family headquarters for the next 40 years. I still remember how my grandparents hated to leave their houses. They'd rather sit on the back porch and watch the garden grow than go anywhere. And when they did go someplace for a special occasion, they had to get back home as quickly as possible. After all, nobody's a watch in the house. When I was old enough to drive and age limited their mobility, sometimes they would ask me to drive them to the Italian club in the De Machine. They were so proud of me, and I felt so important. I will never forget that. I also remember the holidays when everyone, all the relatives and at least a few friends would gather at somebody's house. There'd be tables filled with food and lots of homemade wine. There was always somebody playing music somewhere. There were women in the kitchen, men in the living room or outside under the grape arbor and kids everywhere. First cousins, second cousins, third cousins, I must have had a thousand cousins. After all, my father came from a family of nine, my mother a family of eight, and they all had families, all of whom lived close to us. There were literally cousins of every age, more than enough to go around. And we all found a best friend with at least one and became inseparable during childhood. And I still remember how my grandfathers would sit in the middle of it all, holding court, grinning and nodding their heads as they surveyed their domain, proud of how well their children had done. All the boys were good workers with steady jobs and families of their own. And the girls all married well and had fine husbands and healthy children. And everyone, everyone knew respect. I never realized what a good and unique life I had until I went away to college. And then for the first time I was away from my family and neighborhood and lived amongst them, the Metagons. And their lifestyle was so different. For example, their packages from home consisted of a few cookies and a check. Mine had salami, pepperoni, olives, pizzelles, and whatever else my family thought necessary to sustain life as we knew it. Plus, Mama always included a few dollars in the package along with a note, telling us that she loved us and hoping that we were getting enough to eat. One thing she never asked about was how we were doing in school. That was just understood. You studied hard and you got good grades because you would never let the family down. It was too important. After all, my grandparents had no formal education at all. My parents could not finish high school because they needed to work and help at home. And now here I was in college, fulfilling their dreams. When my grandparents died, things began to change for the family. Slowly at first, but soon uncles and aunts and cousins moved away from the neighborhood and eventually cut down on their visits. The big family gatherings became fewer and something seemed to be missing when we did get together. It just wasn't the same. We didn't realize it, but we were slowly drifting apart as time and space eroded the daily bond that once tied us all so closely together. The holidays changed too. 
The great quantity of food we once consumed without any ill effect wasn't good for us anymore. Too much starch, too much cholesterol, too many calories. And nobody bakes anymore. We're all too busy. We just buy what we need and talk about how much it tastes like moms or grandmas. Even the neighborhood is different. The carefully painted and maintained houses my grandparents bought so long ago are covered with aluminum siding and just don't look the same. My mother still lives in one and strangers, metagons, live in the other. Of course, all the gardens have disappeared now, planted in grass or ground cover. The grape vines are gone and the last of the homemade wine has long since been drunk. For a few years, we did try to make regular rounds and visit but we're all spread too far apart now, so we use the phone a lot. Today, we meet at weddings and funerals and visit the cemetery often. Many of the people we cared about are there now, grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins, even my own father. Now, when we do get together, it's either at my house or my sister's house, and we still enjoy it. After all, family, la familia, is still everything. But for those of us who remember back when, it's just not the same. Too many things are missing or different. We have changed, the neighborhood has changed, and, and the differences between us and them are not so easily defined anymore either. And that's good. I think that's the way it's supposed to be. It is the nature of things to change as surely as the passage of time. My grandparents were Italian Italians. My parents were Italian Americans. I'm an American Italian, and my children are American Americans. We are all Americans now. Irish, German, Polish, Jewish. Call it culture, call it roots, I'm not sure what it really is. Life is still very good, and the memories, the memories are great. But still, there's a small part of me that will always be a little bit sad. My children will never experience firsthand a wonderful and important piece of who they are. They will never get to know my grandparents and the joys of growing up Italian.